time. Um, welcome to our session. This is the K-12 Student Perspective and Interaction ses Session and uh, with AI. And I am so pleased to have with me Sebastian Rao and Parthiva Tama, and hopefully we will have Dara Mata as well joining us uh, pretty soon. And so I have had the wonderful pleasure of hearing their presentations ahead of time last weekend, and I'm really excited to hear their versions of it this weekend uh, as well, and also listen to their responses to each other and the questions that people have. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce myself and then um, start off with Sebastian. I apologize for reading off of my phone, but I'm coming at you from an iPad. And when I um, switch screens, it takes me off the screen. So I'm, I'm reading the introductions uh, off of my phone. So uh, I am Dr. Jaden Lakesley. I'm an abolitionist educator uh, and scholar with a PhD in curriculum and instruction from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And I have 17 years of combined university and pre-K 12 teaching experience. I'm an exclusively collaborative researcher and I examine the connections and disconnects that affect social equity in education, specifically for children of color in public schools. Recently, I've been examining the use of AI as a collaborative and exper experimental tool for lesson planning. And my research has included work with uh, black girls in alternative school who wished to rewrite narratives that they felt had been written for them, examining mindfulness programs in public schools and making space for black children's refusal and exploring the benefits of interdisciplinary uh, arts-based learning projects in elementary schools. So our first speaker today is Sebastian Rao. Um, I do want to also make sure that I mentioned that there is a Q&A but Q button that uh, you should all make use of to ask questions. We'll have time for questions at the end. So Sebastian is coming, um, he's a rising senior in the Commonwealth Governor's School, a STEM magnet program in Virginia. He has studied the use of AI by students and high school debaters and contributed to the March, 2023 book, ChatGPT, navigating the impact of generative AI technologies on educational theory and practice. He's a co-founder of his school's chapter of the International Youth Neuroscience Association and is a nationally ranked high school debater. Welcome, Sebastian. I'm excited to hear your presentation today. All right. I'll be sharing my screen for my uh, PowerPoint slides. And can everybody see that well? All right. Uh, hello, everyone. And thank you uh, so much, Dr. Lakesley, for that introduction. I'm very uh, happy to be here today and to be presenting my particular student perspective on AI and education. Uh, in my presentation, I'll be focusing on especially collaboration within the classroom and how both students and teachers can work together with integrating generative AI into students' educational experiences. So the first thing that I'm gonna talk about is how we as students and teachers should interact with each other's perspectives and uh, engage in student perspectives directly when we're determining how to integrate generative AI into the classroom. So let me start out with just a little bit about myself and how I've engaged with other students on this topic. I'm focusing on the perspectives of my student, peer, uh, my student peers within the public school system and the Commonwealth Governor School in Virginia. And I've also talked with high school students I met while attending different academic programs, as well as talking to uh, both Lincoln Douglas debaters and high school coaches from across the country. One important thing to note, uh, particularly within this presentation when discussing the student perspective, is to remember that there is no one singular view of the uh, impacts on AI and education. There's no one singular view coming from students. And so we have to be careful not to treat students then as a monolithic group in regards to AI and to treat uh, teachers the same way. Instead, having a diversity of perspectives available like we've been able to do this weekend uh, in this conference. Uh, in addition to the interactions that I've had with students, I've also been able to and uh, been very lucky to talk with a number of instructors nationally, both through my work in, con in contributing to the book ChatGPT, as well as in serving as an instructor for a spring webinar about using uh, generative AI. To see more on either of these, uh, as well as my other work within debate, I have a QR code that you can scan that, uh, on the slides that I, I encourage you to check out, so I won't be going as much into depth about uh, any of the individual projects I've been working on. Uh, but through these student and instructor interactions, one thing in particular is that I found that students' perspectives that I've been interacting with do generally seem to diverge from the teaching perspectives. And uh, while both have a variety of serious concerns about the implications of AI, on society in the future. 
So many of the students that I've talked to generally uh, tend to view education actually through a very competitive lens. And this is both in the classroom as well as in actually competitive extracurricular activities. Uh, many can be resistant to collaboration. And this seems to stem from two things. The first is this general resistance to change that tends to uh, pervade a lot of educational spaces, as well as their particular competitive view of the educational process. Uh, there is a lot to unpack about the exact causes of this mindset, you know, how it may be driven by our educational structures themselves. And I can talk more about that later in the session if we have the time. But the uh, important thing to note here is that the combination of resistance to change, as well as the competitive mindset among students, especially makes it more difficult to determine how to use AI specifically as a collaborative tool within the classroom. However, and this is something that's really interesting to note, and then I'll go more in, in the rest of this presentation, is that other areas that would seem to be on face more competitive, such as within competitive speech and debate activities, seem to actually present a model to integrate AI collaboration. Uh, which can be seen specifically in my work uh, for the company Debate Us and the Richmond Debate Institute, which is a summer program in Virginia. Summer debate programs themselves actually utilize this model of collaboration where students who would ordinarily compete against each other during the year come together to share research and ideas. And this is a model of collaboration that I think could work well in other classrooms as we teach students how to use generative AI uh, in, a, in a positive way. So, Traditionally, we know our education system has been largely premised on this idea of uh, developing education to train future workers. And so while this isn't necessarily the best framework and with which to view education and the education of students uh, for the future, many students are still concerned about the use of AI in the classroom, not matching the use of AI in industry. And this is something that was talked about, especially yesterday uh, when we were going through higher education, is how can we prepare students for the future? But this is also something that's seen in the classroom uh, for K-12. A prominent fear that I've seen when discussing this with uh, my peers, uh, as well as um, fellow debaters, is that because the classroom and educational areas are seen as lagging behind the workplace generally, uh, students are concerned that the jobs they are being trained to do either will not be there once they graduate, or that the AI knowledge required uh, for the future was not taught within the classroom. And so this, these general perspectives uh, from students seem to be unique in the way that they, they view the educations uh, and impl the implications of AI as ones that extend past the time and place of the classroom itself, which then impacts their future year in life in a very unique way, which necessitates a, a pretty extreme shift in the educational process itself. Uh, students especially see this dissonance between education and industry. And this uh, is both happening for careers within STEM and the humanities, which seem to now in the future rely heavily on generative AI, as well as AI technologies generally. Uh, of course, then we have obviously a lot of teachers that are concerned uh, that schools are either too lax with AI restrictions or they're afraid of implementing too much AI use in the classroom, even if that would better prepare students for future uh, jobs and uh, future use. And this perspective is especially fueled by viewing the use of AI as influencing like the lack of student honesty in the classroom. A lot of teachers have these concerns, and I'm sure many of the uh, viewers here uh, share uh, a lot of those. And the main question is then when we're uh, navigating how to develop these uh, develop educational systems is how can we integrate new AI tools into the classroom while addressing concerns about AI restrictions and honor code violations? And how can teachers themselves use AI tools to expedite the learning process for their students? Uh, so one uh, unique perspective that I've certainly heard from educators at large institutions, and especially some people at some of the larger and better supported debate programs in the country, is what I like to term as equity as cheating. And so generally, we can see AI use uh, as a great equalizer when we're discussing its use towards expediting the education process. And this is something that we can use to make sure that people have access to high quality education that's provided by technology. Uh, general technological developments like those with AI tend to serve as equalizers. They help bridge the gap between lower income or marginalized communities and well-off groups, especially within education. But at a lot of these institutions, these large institutions and those that run them that already prosper in the status quo, they view AI as something that, although uh, could serve as an equalizer, as cheating too much or bridging the current view of academic honesty in the classroom that they themselves established. So then even, when, for example, viewing AI as just a tutor resource, when those that are well off can afford even private prep classes and be far ahead, these larger institutions and programs will simultaneously push these messages of inclusivity and project while also restricting the use of new technologies to assist in education where it's most needed. 
And this is an issue actually throughout most all educational institutions, but it becomes particularly salient when looking at the use of generative AI within K-12. So the main goal then, when taking into account both teacher and student perspectives across a spectrum of uh, socioeconomic backgrounds, is how to connect these teacher and student concerns and solve both of them uh, within a future model uh, of education and how to view integration of AI. So the general view that I have, uh, that I bring with my student perspective to this and how to solve these issues when integrating AI into the curriculum is to view education through a more collaborative lens. And this approach can combine addressing teacher and student concerns in one model by increasing both the teacher and student stake in a collaborative classroom environment. And then we can look for collaboration between students, uh, between the students and the teachers, and now between students, teachers, and AI bots that can serve within more of a tutor role. And so uh, to, to develop this more forward thinking model, we must be teaching for future use, which involves both instructing teachers to use AI in the classroom, as well as teaching students on how to use it collaboratively and use it um, in a way that is more productive. And so what this would mean is that teachers are both being, in, being instructed on how to use AI uh, with AI literacy programs and students uh, knowing how to both collaborate between themselves and then move AI into that collaborative position. And so you can actually see this already. We already have a model that's been implemented uh, within higher education, especially, uh, such as in within like recitation sections led by graduate students after large lectures, having a helpful break off into smaller groups to discuss or collaborate uh, with peers as well as instructors. And this is a model that AI uh, can integrate with as you can collaborate with the bot itself, whether or not you traditionally would have the capability to collaborate with an instructor or other students. And so AI essentially equalizes the aspect of education that requires collaboration with others. And so one specific approach, and you can see I have an image on the uh, slideshow here that's from a classroom, is using Socratic seminars, for example, as a model for one part of this uh, collaboration in, in the classroom. You can have an integrated conversation here with an AI bot like ChatGPT prior to the discussion as well as during the discussion. You can generate ideas, like have brainstorming sessions, and be able to connect both between the students, uh, the students to the technology, and then uh, put, bring in that teacher and the AI bot as tutor perspective as well. And then something that I've been touching on slightly uh, that can also be important within this model is having a, a connection between classroom instruction and at-home use, which is essentially some kind of continuity uh, between different parts of our education. And this connection between at-home use and within the classroom uh, generally falls under this generative AI as tutor model, as we saw especially highlighted yesterday and discussing things like Conmigo's impact on student learning. And so to bring these two ideas together, to integrate instruction both with the tutor model as well as with the collaboration model I've outlined, we have the overall bot as coach model instruction. And so this essentially is the implementation that's already happened uh, within higher education uh, collaboration models and can be ingrained more within K-12 and actually has already been uh, integrated within the world of academic student debate. So this uh, kind of debate instruction uh, using within summer programs, these are, are called labs, which are similar to recitation sections and, and integrate large things like uh, Socratic seminars uh, in which you can have students collaborating uh, within uh, uh, debate programs or other preparation groups that would usually compete against each other. And what this model really shows is the value of collaboration, even within a system like competitive debate uh, that encourages competition usually to the extreme. And so what's valuable about this model specifically is that because hyper competition within these uh, very fast extracurricular activities like debate breeds fast innovation just to keep up like with the current model of competition, we can see that students, instructor, students and instructors have been forced to integrate AI very fast into the model they already have, which as I've talked a bit about has been this model of collaboration, integrating Socratic seminars and having something similar to recitation sections every day. And so at first, when I was looking at AI use compared to this collaborative model within debate programs, I, I viewed it as a hindrance uh, to implementation of AI uh, in that model of collaboration. But I soon came to realize throughout the spring and early summer that because AI is imp actually implemented so much easier within this collaborative model we already use, that we can actually use this model of debate instruction as a model to expedite AI in integration into education more generally. And so essentially, uh, what this can mean is that we can have both collaboration between students, uh, collaboration between students and the bot, uh, tutoring that is given by individual AI programs, as well as coaching that happens either with a tutor, an AI bot, or between individual students. Uh, this past summer, a softer version of this full system was actually implemented at the Richmond Debate Institute for middle and high schoolers, which offers holistic instruction for speech and debate. 
uh, starting in 2023 with lectures about AI, the use of AI in the writing process, and then within labs for debate preparation, even extending into use for college applications and career readiness in terms of uh, argument and connection to the law. And so for even middle schoolers at this program who'd never really participated within academic debate before, the use of chat GPT for brainstorming purposes to polish argumentation and discussion in the lab environment really expedited their learning process and is something that I definitely think should be used more in the future. So the final thing that's important to ask here, though, is essentially like, how do we implement this model? This uh, How do teachers work to implement this within the classroom? And I've talked a lot about integration within a collaborative model, and uh, that is something that a lot of traditional educators are very resistant to, especially changing or undermining the way that they traditionally view the classroom, and, and we do generally when we're thinking about K-12 education. And so the first thing that's important is that before we teach AI to students, it must be taught to teachers. Uh, this generally would look like the completion of AI literacy courses, right? Uh, the director of the Richmond Debate Institute, for example, had completed uh, a, a Debate Us AI course for teachers and in instruction, and then use that to work AI into the lab-based curriculum. So it's an important first step that can then catalyze that future work within uh, actually the classroom. And so ultimately then we can have these uh, programs like AI literacy instruction that starts teachers thinking about how to use prompting, right? How they can teach it within the classroom and how to use AI even themselves to create their own instruction. And then as we use it, like uh, many teachers can continue to implement AI into the classroom for students themselves to use, both to collaborate with and to use AI as a tutor that then supplements traditional instruction. And so I believe personally that this AI integrated collaborative model of learning can best help to both preserve those soft or durable skills that we strive to teach uh, students within traditional education while integrating AI at the right level for students to learn and navigate for the future. So connecting back and solving that initial concern that many students had that extended past use in the classroom. And I think that this is especially useful and that is a good first step to overall AI integration. So those are my general thoughts on the use of AI in the classroom and my student perspective. Uh, thank you so much for listening and I'll be ready to answer questions in a bit. Thank you so much, Sebastian. That is, I, I am just uh, love this whole entire presentation. One of the things I really am um, appreciative of is, of is the dichotomies that you present, right? So like competition versus collaboration, uh, use in the classroom versus industry. Uh, the, you know, kind of preparing for now versus the future, which is, you know, something that we bring up in education a lot, um, equity versus cheating, which you term as equity as teaching, but really that's the way it's being treated. Um, and so uh, I'm interested to see how both of, uh, both you and Parthiva's uh, work kind of comes into conversation with each other at the end. I see there's one question um, that's in the, in the question and answer. So I'm hoping that more questions will get populated as we continue. So just don't forget uh, our participants that uh, we have that question and answer button there. And um, I already have a qu couple of questions that I'm gonna be putting in there as well. Thank you. And so I'm going to introduce Parthi Vatama. He is a rising senior at Doherty Valley High School in San Ramon, California. As an aspiring software programmer, he currently works as an intern at Nebulon. He finds anything tech related to be interesting and loves to challenge uh, his varying skill set. And so I am going to uh, let him take over. Thank you so much, Parthiva. Hi, everyone. I'm going to share my slides now. Hi, everyone. My name is Parthi Vatama, and I'm today you're I'm going to be telling you all my perspective and my interactions with AI. So how have I used AI? Uh, as you guys know, there's like billions of different applications of AI right now. There's R writing, but me personally, I've used chat GPT in order to assist my writing. Uh, whenever I'm stuck uh, with a thesis or I'm stuck trying to get that last bit of reasoning out of a piece of evidence, I like ChatGPT can really help. I use Conmigo, uh, which is Khan Academy's uh, integrated AI, in order to help me with my math skills because it really helps having something, a course that can go at your own pace instead of having one size fits all, which is what the classroom uses. 
I use Quillbot in order to summarize a long reading into sh shorter readings in order to save some time, get some stress off my back. And I like to use Grammarly in order to use its grammar improvements. Uh, the suggestions are very useful. Also, and for art stuff, for fun, I like to use Crayon and Adobe Photoshop Generative AI. So I asked my friends, how has AI affected your academic career? So this first person was talking about how they use AI in order to handle busy work that the school gives. Now, AI, well, although they could, it could be considered cheating, these, he wants to spend more time on, on actual work that he feels is more important to his academic career instead of just doing the busy work. And so in order to save his time, he likes to use AI. And the second person is on the opposite side of the spectrum. They feel that they have abused AI and it's done almost all their work for them. And they also mentioned that it has a negative impact on people who struggle on, in school and rely on it because they can also get caught. And since they rely on it, if, uh, AI is, if their access to AI is taken away, they're just going to drop down on the academic scale. And it really shows, right? You have one person who likes to use it to help them, but then you also have another person who's seemed to have been using it in the same way, but they feel that it's really hurt them. This next person says AI didn't impact their school career, but they like to use it to review their essays and get tips on how to improve it, just like I do. They also mentioned that using ChatGPT to do research or write papers or do whatever work for you is lazy. And they say that they have an extreme lack of respect for anyone who does because it's understandable because if you have people who just use ChatGPT to do their work, they're being dishonest. And while well, you're giving AI a bad name, if people haven't used ChatGPT in order to write essays and everything, and they only use it as a tool to help them, we'd see AI in a much different light than we do currently. This next person says AI, like ChatGPT, is an unreliable source of information. They also say that ChatGPT can get detected by many tools, and so they won't use it for school. And they also believe that the ideas it gives and are kind of basic and useless. It's AI, like ChatGPT, was trained on a model of just, it was given a, a set of data. And so depending on if the data was properly filtered or not, you could get bad, what was it? You get bad outcomes. For example, uh, I remember there was this, these people who made AI make like a whole little TV show on Twitch. It was fully generative and everything. But one day chat GPT, like the engine they were using went down. So they had to switch to one which was had unfiltered data. And that led to the uh, show becoming something that was very inappropriate. And so that's, and that's what this person's getting at. If the data that the AI is trained on is incorrect or harmful, then the outcome will be just as, as bad. When yeah, now this person gave me a big quote, but to just uh, sum it up, they use AI in order to help them. Uh, they use Khan Academy's bot for learning math concepts. And yeah, they also said, you know, the, for example, breaking down a math concept and reframing it to match exactly the place your level of understanding is coming from or mashing code info together to fit your current problem, other which you'd otherwise have to spend much more time sifting through multiple tutorials and picking out concepts. I know at least everyone at one point didn't understand a topic and you'd probably spend one or two hours having to go through like books, the internet, trying to find what where you're what you're missing but having ai in or do most of the heavy lifting for you saves you time and you'll probably learn it better they also use github copilot x for coding projects because it's faster to figure out their approach and it's and you know 
it'll probably take longer to scan through like the entire documentation of the code in order to find what they're looking for. So what should educators do? Now, in the quotes, we've seen people using it for, you know, harmful, using it in harmful ways. And you have people who used it in a positive way. So the educators should be implementing useful AI or helpful AI into their lesson plans, such as Conmigo, which is Khan Academy's uh, AI, Grammarly, in order to help students improve their writing, and Quillbot, in order to just, which is also more grammar. And some ways that educators can prevent the use of harmful AI is uh, first having some zero tolerance policies and using ChatGPT detectors. You know, if we want to prevent the use, we got to, you know, get it strict. And currently AI doesn't have a big book of ethics that we can refer to and figure out how to use properly. And so currently I think teach uh, places all over the U S have been starting to just ban AI because people have just haven't been using it. Right. And we should also start training students how to use AI ethically, just like how schools have taught us how to use computers and Google for proper research purposes. So why should educators use AI? Well, AI can simulate having a one-on-one -on -one tutor and with, let's just say a high school teacher who has like six classes of 30 people each, that's like 180-ish people to keep track of. It's hard uh, just to keep track of that many students and their individual progress. And so being able to have AI simulate a one-on-one -on -one tutor uh, it's able to conform to the students learning needs and so it'll be able to explain open-ended questions instead of teachers having to you know look exactly for the answer AI will just get it right off the bat uh, and it also enables learning without fear of judgment with these one-on-one uh, -on -one tutors because I know there's I know many introverted individuals who just don't like to raise their hand in class because you you know, they have a fear, uh, maybe irrational or not, that they'll get made fun of for asking what they consider to be a stupid question. But with AI, since everything's more personal, one on one, there isn't that that fear isn't necessary anymore. Teachers can also save time by get by making AI do all the tedious and unnecessary tasks such as grading, creating assignments. And, you know, that free time can be better spent improving lessons plans or getting more office hours with students. That is, and thank you for listening. Thank you so much, um, Parthiva. I really like these uh, these suggestions at the end, especially. There's uh, been actually a lot, um, if you have, uh, both of you can uh, kind of swim on into the chat as well, because there has been quite a bit going on um, and both of, I think you've driven some conversation in the chat which I am uh, I've been kind of fascinatingly watching um, just people kind of been debating back and forth about that especially there was a comment about useful or helpful and unhelpful AI um, and uh, so this is really fascinating to me um, one of the things that I really appreciated is that just like wealth of different types of AI that you've been using to just, as I put so diverse, um, curious to know if you've tried Google Bard, because that's one of the ones that I've been um, kind of playing around with because of his, I, I'll call it him, just I don't know why, but um, he's connected, you know, to the internet. And so that's one of the things that I found was the difference between like the free version of ChatGPT and Bard is that when I put things in, Bard, you know, Bard can look things up, right, and find things that ChatGPT doesn't necessarily have access to. Um, so I'm going to go into the Q&A since we, I don't think Dara is with us, um, and I, I, I'm going to be off screen for a second just so that I can see. Um, so while I wait for some of the questions to be put into the top from the moderators, moderators I'm actually curious to know, um, I was making a couple of notes here because I noticed that um, Parthiva has a couple of um, dichotomies as well. And that's that the, the dichotomies that you found is in, in, in between the um, student responses, right? The ways in which people have 
found um, AI to be helpful and or sometimes a little harmful. Um, I have found this in my own work as well that um, AI is only as reliable sometimes as it is trained to be. And so, as you saw, as you mentioned, that you know when things go down, sometimes it really goes down, and it can take you down with it. Um, and uh, so, I, I had a, a really interesting experience with Bard where. Um, I asked it if I could do something and it kept telling me, oh, yes, you, you can. And then I, when, it, when it failed, I said, well, that's not working. And it said, you're correct. It can't do that. And so it kept, it kept going back and forth into this loop of, you know, like, I said, well, okay, so how do I do it? And then it said, click on this button that didn't exist on my screen. And I said, that button's not there. And then he said, you're correct. That button is not there. And so it just we kept going back and around and around and around. And, and it was hilarious, but it was kind of interesting to see how, um, again, it's only as reliable as it is. Um, so you had, a lot, you had some students that you talked to who um, accessed AI to handle busy work, others who completely abused it uh, in order to do all of their work, which then made them kind of rely, re rely on it a little bit too much. Um, I'm curious to know, as we're waiting for a, a little bit more questions to come in, as you were listening to each other's presentations, did it make you reflect on your own work in any way? I mean, like what were some things that came to mind as you were listening? You know, and so I just would just pose that to either one of you, Sebastian or Partheva. Um, how did that you know, make you think on what you're doing in the future of, of how you move forward? Sure. So I can I can go ahead and uh, jump in on this first. Um, so generally, I think it's very interesting, especially to hear uh, directly from individuals uh, that uh, Partiva was uh, discussing. You know, these uh, especially as you pointed out, Dr. Lakesley, uh, this extra dichotomy that does exist within student perspectives, which is something that I made sure to note. We have to, you know, in my presentation, have this uh, diversity of perspectives available. Certainly. Uh, one thing that I do find really interesting is that uh, there are students who uh, view AI as, although they're using it to help them with assignments, they seem to be uh, using it in a way that is counter to uh, how they feel personally about its use, which is something that's really interesting because uh, this is something that, although I've heard from students that maybe they don't, they want to, uh, you know, limit its use in the classroom in some ways, but they like it in other ways. I think it's really interesting that uh, you have students who uh, kind of have this inter inner conflict that is happening and they don't really have guidance on how to use it. So I think that's uh, especially interesting to look at when we're talking about, you know, uh, then when we're leading discussions, leading students learning how to use this and it's pr uh, productivity for education, there really isn't a way that students are being taught to think about this. And there really isn't any, or even the lack of thinking themselves that is a, not able to be guided by, uh, let's say, any really um, uh, policies that are even effective within the classroom. Uh, so this is something that certainly opens up another, uh, you know, uh, another discussion about how do we apply the stuff, particularly that I talked about, like within this model that we can apply to education, teachers can be able to implement uh, collaborative um, use of artificial intelligence, you know, how does that guide student thought, especially when there are these interconflicts? So I'd, I'd be interested to hear from uh, Partiva about how that could be, you know, uh, how that could be resolved, especially within uh, this uh, newer model. Yeah, you, uh, you want me to answer about how uh, students could try to fix their inner conflicts on AI? Sure. So just I, I'm just thinking, you know, after hearing your presentation specifically talking about uh, that conflict that students are having and the lack of guidance and lack of, uh, uh, you know, uh, understanding of how to use it, especially when they're using it, but they think that they're actually the ones using it wrong. How can that kind of be uh, resolved in the future? As you said, uh, we should have more AI literacy courses available for students and more and uh, t educators so that they get a better understanding of how to properly use AI instead of just feeling like they're abusing it or feeling like they're, you know, using it correctly, even if there aren't. So I think just first we need to get more just AI literacy out there because there's still a lot of people who just still don't understand AI properly and well enough it to you know g figure out how to use it properly so i mean ai liter literacy courses are a start and i guess 
soon in the future uh the ai will become common knowledge like how google is today i um i'm seeing some questions now that have been populated into the document and one of the things i wanted we, so what we were talking about about the uh, the bots kind of not uh, you know uh failing right is it's uh, into this concept of hallucination so um i'm wondering if one of you can um maybe just D define hallucination for those who don't know, um, because we do have people who are not AI experts in the, in the chat and in the participation um, in, in our audience today. Um, so the second question that we have up on the top of the document is, um, given the chance for hallucination, would uh, middle schoolers be able to recognize when AI makes these mistakes and correct them, or will they be simply using AI as if it is an infallible calculator or whatever subject, right? So even though it isn't, um, and I think that's that's something that I'm working on as well when it comes to, so what the work that I'm doing is on using AI as, Parthiva, you mentioned this, uh, help for lesson planning, right? As but, but if you are, say, a new teacher, and maybe you're not as uh, good at lesson planning yet, and you're using AI to help you lesson plan, and it makes a mistake somewhere, you may not be as you know, good at catching it as somebody like me who's been doing this for 17 years. So I'm curious to know what you think. There's a question above it that talks about, you know, using AI in high school versus earlier grades, right? So how how do you, what are your suggestions for um, working with younger kids versus older kids and using this in the classroom, catching hallucinations? Hmm. If we want to start, you know, having AI even have some more widespread use, we have to eventually start teaching uh, younger people how to use it. But currently, in its current state, uh, AI is still uh, AI is still a decently new thing. Still has a lot of uh, kinks that needs to be worked out. So I feel that right now, students in early grades should have almost very little access to it. To this current state and hopefully uh once we can get ai you know better situated into schools uh, lesson plans then we can give them a little basic version of ai and yeah, i guess with hallucinations you know uh they were talking about how if the ai makes mistakes will younger people understand that oh, i mean unless this student really cares like if they're actually using ai as a tool they might actually figure it out but if you just have a student who just throws it their uh whatever homework assignment prompt and then just takes whatever the ai gives gives them and puts it and submits that then i guess you know so it really depends on who's using it and how they're using it so i think uh in particular when we're talking about uh, I think the question was specific to middle schoolers, but this would also extend farther down too. Uh, one thing that I think is important to note is that obviously uh, AI is already used within the classroom. So this is like this inevitability uh, idea that uh, really it's kind of hard to establish the idea that we should just uh, completely eliminate any use of artificial intelligence. And I think that uh, in particular, when we're looking at uh, those who right now are lacking guidance with AI, the idea that we should instead try to emphasize the elimination of it or the, uh, the categorical prohibition of its use in the classroom actually is what can in many cases drive that lack of understanding, right? If students right now have no view on how am I supposed to use AI, I don't understand what hallucination is, I'm going to copy it and submit it in this part of my assignment or this project that was take home because it was not uh, established in the classroom, that is what in that case is driving this uh, the, these, uh, the misuse of the tools themselves. And so uh, a solution to this or a potential application of how this could be used for younger students really is just uh, being very upfront uh, with students and, and making sure that teachers, uh, you know, help younger students. Understand in particular, uh, this past within the Richmond Debate Institute were middle school students. And there were quite a few uh, middle school debaters who at the time, one, for example, one student had not even heard of ChatGPT itself, for example, right? And uh, other students were like, oh, I've used this before. I've used it, you know, 
to like just spit out an essay or something like that. And then, you know, it re removes that idea of thinking. So the first thing that was established that we tried to talk about uh, was uh, first, you know, how to ethically use this within debate in particular, right? That is very, that we were working within a particular context for within competitive speech and debate. But then secondly, when we're using it, you know, how should we verify it? Like, how should we go about checking the historical examples and things that you're asking it to do? Uh, one thing in particular um, is that uh, we were working with for some middle school uh, debaters, this I, this uh, topic regarding like military policies within the Arctic, and so students were asking ChatGPT for historical context. And then the uh, extra step that was then implemented within uh, when we were doing brainstorming and, and things like that, and when we were discussing, is that we would then throw out ideas, right? We'd be discussing these with each other, and then uh, we encourage students to then go and look these up and verify them themselves. And so it became routine for a lot of these students then to not just take what the AI was saying at face value, uh, but instead to be using it really when they were at a complete loss for you know how to start grasping a topic, then to start using it for brainstorming ideas and then verifying the information was giving them. And so really it was used then to prompt human thinking and really something that in with it with in the absence of would not have been able to be as effective and they would have a lot harder time grasping uh what oftentimes are more uh complicated topics and so uh particularly um when students were uh were you know having a hard time understanding that use and teaching that how to use it uh in an ethical way and how to use it in a way that is productive is especially important. So to conclude uh, my thoughts on that, I think the idea that we should just completely prohibit it then really is what may cause those problems to happen. I love I love this. I love this uh, because I think that's exactly kind of what's going on between a lot of people right now. And we're seeing it in the news, we're seeing it everywhere. I'm seeing it in, in academic settings. Um, and I think this, it boils down to also, and I'm sure this is being brought up in the chat, that um, we've had this debate. I mean, when, when Wikipedia came out, the same exact thing happened where it was like, okay, is this a, a reliable source of information? Who's writing these things? And and how, and do we let you know kids uh, use the internet to, to look things up? I mean, this happened 20, 30 years ago when we were um, debating the use of, you know, whether to stick with the encyclopedias in the classroom and, and all of that, or, or whether we use the internet. And, and this is exactly um, where we're at now with new technology. And that was one of actually going to be one of my, my questions to you um, was, you know, kind of how do you handle? Um, so I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to just kind of bring this up. Uh, and then also I have a question that I've kind of, I haven't highlighted it, but I've, I've selected it in the document that I think applies to this, um, where Basically, right now, it seems like with much technology, any kind of technology that you have in the classroom, in, in academic spaces, in learning spaces, um, there are two ma mainly dichotomous ways of treating it. Usually, you know, there's either it's it's becomes a content content delivery device, right, where it's like, you know, um, for instance, YouTube, right, where it's it just becomes well, let's look some things up. We can use YouTube to look up how to whatever or find a video on something, or we can use it as an actual tool for learning in which you can actually, you can use it as you could, you could make YouTube videos. You could use it as a, there's all kinds of different things. And so it becomes an actual, the technology itself becomes content. And that's where we're looking at AI as well, right? So where AI could be a content delivery tool or AI itself also becomes the content and a really rich, empowering tool for learning and for uh, growth and skill development. And so um, we have a question in the, in the document that uh, says, is there any application of AI in the classroom you have come across in the media or in the classroom yourself that looks to you from the student perspective as largely out of touch with what students need? And I think this speaks to a little bit like what Sebastian was talking about, about you know, what we, what you need for the future to prepare for the future or you know are we just only learning you know kind of right in the moment so, so either, I, sure go ahead all right so uh this uh talking about specific applications that may conflict with a student perspective 
is certainly very interesting because it also uh, you know makes it clear that this the idea of both not only student perspectives as having you know different ideas going with them but also the applications of AI obviously are also very diverse and so one thing that I guess this kind of brings into the discussion is you know how do we apply it in different ways that may or may not either conflict with student perspectives or you know help students in a way that they are already comfortable with and so uh, one thing that is um, particularly interesting then is when looking at this idea of uh, use of AI within both education for literature and language classes and uh, particularly uh, you know essay writing perspectives as well as uh, within you know uh, other places like for argument generation for debate for example and uh, this the student perspective here I think particularly when we're talking about if we want to narrow it down very uh, very fast to this idea of just generative AI that is producing content uh, for particularly essay writing, right? This is a big hot topic, like how should we approach this? And it's very specific when we're talking about, because AI generally has much more and many more implications than just uh, this in, in this one scenario. And we are already like uh, later in the day, we'll have more discussions about applications for many, a multitude of different subjects. Uh, but particularly the idea of the application of AI in the classroom to be limited to uh, before the writing of the essay itself, but learning the uh, the content versus then the actual uh, the analysis of you know how, how how well have students learned this, such as how well they can write an essay or how well they can work on a project, certainly is where there are the most conflicting ideas. And so on the one hand, we have people thinking we should transition back to. Um, you know, timed writes that happen entirely within a classroom that can then eliminate the use of AI, which is something that I find an oftentimes very convincing perspective to be able to test student needs. And on the other hand, we can also have, uh, you know, things like uh, project based learning, for example, within this model where students can work together and use AI to help produce a product at the end. And so the conflict that uh, happens really from a student perspective, as well as teachers, is you know how much is cheating a concern, right? That's really the thing that we're all thinking when we're talking about, you know, the analysis of how well students have learned. And I think uh, the application of AI, particularly within a model that is looking towards essay writing, that isn't able to incorporate collaboration or projects and also isn't within the classroom is where we see the most cheating. And that's a lot of specification. And the reason why I feel the need to specify it that much is because if we're able to bring in other student perspectives, uh, a project-based learning, you know, looking at uh, writing within the classroom versus, you know, uh, you know, brainstorming beforehand, we are really able to solve a lot of those problems. And so right now, because we're stuck in this traditional view of how do we write essays and learn, we're thinking there's going to be a lot more cheating and a lot more issues. Uh, and uh, that's where a lot of our concerns come from. And so I think I've touched already a lot on, especially in my presentation as I'm talking through here, how we can start to resolve those issues, particularly with, right, how are we teaching students how to learn versus how are we like um, testing them and how are we testing them in projects in class or, you know, out of school essays. And so really uh, changing the way we view that and making it not so, uh, you know, uh, set in stone that we have to evaluate uh, student learning in one particular way, as well as we have to prohibit use in all, in all cases that might deal with like language or literature. Uh, if we make that shift, I think that's able to resolve a lot of these concerns. Um, Parthiba, do you have any last uh, thoughts on that before we transition to the next session? I mean, Sebastian really summed it up really, really well. <laughs> I, so, yeah. yeah, I agree. I, I really... Uh, I love this conversation and I wish this was longer because I wish, I mean, honestly, I think it could keep going where uh, the great thing is that we have that Q and a document that you all will be able to respond to. And so um, I encourage everybody to, uh, you know, return. Uh, we're going to, there will be a brainstorming session um, at two o'clock uh, central time. So whatever that is for, for everybody um, that's, I think noon uh, Pacific, and that'll be three o'clock my time, Eastern time. Um, so I just want, I'm going back through my notes. Uh, the next session, speaking of language and literacy, so there's going to be three parallel sessions next um, coming up on K-12, Redefining Education in the AI, AI Era. So there will be STEM, language and literacy, um, or human, uh, sorry, humanities and social studies. And so whatever applies to you, please jump into one of those. Um, thank you so, so very much, Sebastian and Parthiva. I'm actually, I, you know, I, I, I'm sad that Dara didn't get to join us, but at the same time, it was so wonderful to hear from both of you in such a robust way. Um, and I think both of your presentations presented us with wonderful points of view. So thank you very much. And thank you all of our participants. And I hope to see you in the next session.
All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lakesley and Partiva and everybody who's watching. Uh, hopefully you've, uh, you know, taken something away from this. And I certainly uh, very have definitely enjoyed sharing my perspective on the use of AI. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.